Warpugs. So, Pizza Demon wanted me to check out something from West Hammer. And this is The Deep Warp and Other Creepy Mysteries. That is a 12-hour topic in and of itself. But what I'm thinking is he picked a couple to actually go with because there's a lot of stuff that happens in the warp that we don't really talk about. Um, personally, I like, you know, I would love some explanation, not, not some explanation, some exploration of the Crone Worlds, the former seat of the Eldari Empire. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be a factional thing. I really don't. I don't quite know what he's going to go into here. But we will find out. We're going to get into this. Um, and we'll see if I know any of these things. Because I already know about the deep... Deep Warp Theory is a thing that not a lot of people talk about. But it is a thing. So, this is... I got a feeling this is going to be... Right up my alley, and I'm going to learn some stuff in here that I didn't know before. And I'm always a fan of that. Let's go. Guys, Wes Hammer's links are going to be in the description down below, right next to my own. Check out the Brickco, and uh, that's in the description down below. I think I can shut up now. Warpugs, let's get into it. By the way, now that I know I have to fix this thing again... Because it busts on me every single time it gets a chance. Um, we are still waiting. Me and the hospitaler are still waiting for pups. And that's why we don't have a live stream going on right now on them. War pugs, let's get into it. It's finally spooky season, and you know what that means. It's a perfect opportunity to talk about some creepy and obscure mysteries from the grimdark future of Warhammer 40k. Let's get from into it. a beloved techno-archaeologist who disappeared deep beneath the surface of Mars, leaving behind only a single clue to what happened. Arkham a deeply disturbing Vox recording of his final moments. A strange species of aliens that scientists Arkham haven't lands. been able to explain. Oh. And although originally thought to just be void-born pests, when attacked, demonstrated some truly frightening powers. And if the accounts of one particular madman are to be believed, the secret of what these things actually are is absolutely mind-blowing. We're also going to be talking about a theory that says that everything that we think we know about the warp is wrong, and how there's an area within the Sea of Souls that even the gods themselves are afraid to go to. We're going to be talking about all that and a whole lot more, but before we dive headfirst into the grimdark, I would love to see how he, like, because one of the big things I, I love to talk about whenever somebody asks me about the Deep Warp is the Enslaver Plague. Now, the Enslaver Plague, if you don't know what that is, I can't, I, I, I'll see if he mentions it. I'll see if he mentions it. I'm shutting up until then. A quick shout out to this video's sponsor. Are you oh, too you busy to cook this fall, but still want to make sure you're eating healthy? No. Then why not skip the trip to the grocery store, as well as all the chopping, prepping, and cleanup time as well, by switching to Factor, the sponsor of today's video. Oh. Their fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes and delivered right to your front door. All you have to do is heat and enjoy, then go back to crushing your goals. They have over 35 weekly flavor-packed meals to choose from that promote a healthy lifestyle and meet your meal preferences. There's no way to get me to live a healthy, healthy lifestyle. I'm eternally screwed. All designed by their team of gourmet chefs with ingredients with integrity that help you feel your best all day long. I'm a huge fan of Factor, as running a YouTube studio full-time by myself doesn't really leave me with much time to cook nowadays, but I'm also a man who appreciates good food. Factor saves me time by cutting down on trips to the grocery store and is incredibly flexible. I can adjust my order size to include meals for a loved one or even skip a week if I know I have a special event coming up. They have flamingos that make sticking to my goals easy. I had a and most importantly, I had a feeling he was Florida man. Their meals taste absolutely phenomenal. Head to factor75.com or click on the link below and use code WESHAMMER50 to get 50% off your first box. Again, head on over to factor75.com or click on the link below and use code WESHAMMER50 to get 50% off your first box. Thank you to Factor for sponsoring this video. Oh my goodness, I'm coughing. The mysterious entities known as the Umbra. Okay. The Milky Way galaxy of the 41st millennium has no shortage of strange and bizarre Xenos life forms, and most of which have either gone undocumented or the study and cataloging of is only in its infancy. 
Amongst them, the creatures known as the Umbra are perhaps the strangest. They appear as smooth black spheres that live within the void of space and are often attracted to areas that resonate with the war. Mm -hmm. Voidfarers have traded tales of these things for centuries, of hundreds if not thousands of them showing up and hovering around their ships, being particularly attracted to their warp engines. For the longest time, they seemed relatively harmless and were originally viewed as just a pest. But the reality was that that couldn't possibly be further from the truth. There was one particular instance where an Umbra managed to make it inside one of the ships. This is a brief snippet from the account of Navigator Uncle Nakis, who witnessed the event. Observing quarantine procedure, the officer of the watch ordered the pest destroyed and summoned stormtroopers to that end. No sooner had they opened fire than all hell broke loose. The creature was able to manipulate areas of darkness, drawing upon matter like oil from those zones of deepest shadow, mm -hmm. the cracks between the bulkheads, beneath crates of supplies, even from the pupils of our own eyes. This assemblage of umbrose material was deployed in the most horrific fashion, a confluence of hooks, blades, teeth, and the like. Seeing his squad slaughtered and the barrage ineffectual, the commissar ordered a retreat and vented the hangar to the void. It would turn out that incidents like these were not particularly uncommon. There would be many reports of these creatures turning up in great quantities across the Imperium with alarming frequency. Most of the time they were easily dispersed, though at other times they would turn violently murderous. Entire ships had been lost to these Shadowsmiths, the satellite. Now you can see why people thought that just based off that general imagery, why this was the um, considered to be the villain of the Astartes. Like, uh, um, oh God, my brain. Samia's Astartes project. If you haven't seen Astartes, why haven't you? Lights ripped apart, even planetary colonies engaged by shapeless dark matter entities, which only the mightiest weapons can harm. The only thing that truly seems to hurt them, or at the very least scare them off, is great quantities of light. But even that is a double-edged sword, as casting that much light on them creates shadows that they can manipulate. A single one of these spheres having the potential to create armies of eldritch shadow monstrosities and a hurricane of bleated limbs and snapping jaws. Don't you At just one love point, it? One of the Umbra was dissected in order to be studied. It was said to have a surface that was uniformly black with a carapace temperature that remained at 10 degrees Celsius despite the application of melta beams or liquid nitrogen. It had no obvious means of motion, yet in confinement would hover at about head level. It had no respiratory, digestion, or excretion tracts, and thus was determined not to be an organism in the traditional sense. Now, after the scientists had completed their physical observations of the specimen, they decided to euthanize it by exposing its cell to a continuous blast of strong light. Mm -hmm. They sent in six illuminator drones, pre-configured to adopt evenly spaced positions around the subject. The illuminators were activated at full strength for a period of about 30 seconds, and the subject's body appeared as if it was brightening. It was in that moment that all of the humans that were witnessing the execution suddenly experienced intense cranial pain. They were assaulted by a barrage of mental images that depicted a vast humanoid figure splintering apart, scenes of a turbulent warp storm, deep space, and a single word pulsing through their minds. Linger. As quickly as it began, uh -huh. the phenomena abruptly ended and the dead Umbra dropped to the floor. The Umbra still have a lot of secrets and the list of known facts about them is dwarfed by the unknown. But whatever they actually are, and whatever their purpose is, they clearly have a demonstrable warp presence and seem naturally drawn to areas that resonate with the warp, whether they be the hulls of void ships or suspected points of access to the Eldar webway. Calculus Logai Beer of the Mechanicus theorized that the Umbra were but a minuscule portion of extra-dimensional creatures. Inquisitor Maturin Rally speculated that they were innately hostile to human life and may be seeking to purge those species within the physical universe that caused the warp to become such a turbulent place. They Can the Eldar go first? I'm just asking for a friend. And not only that, not only that, since when has an Inquisitor determined that uh, Zeno's life form wasn't hostile? There was also the account of the admittedly confessed heretic, Curdo Salvador, who was burned at the stake after writing it. Visited I was by the thirster in the dark, her who dance moans, her who keeps her secrets breasted, her who came upon me and told and told. Time before she was born, she told, time before all that. 
Wars in heaven and hell, star mm. devils lock horns triumphant, and old gods kill the way. Killed, she says, all but one. Hid away he did, up to his old ways, tweaking and dabbling, poking and prodding. She says, came a time when he's done his work, wants to hide and watch, always watching. So into the warp he goes. Yeah. Then she's born in the long ears brain, see, and she Slash. laughs out loud and chops him a million times and kicks the shards out into the cold to linger, she says, to linger like always. If his account is to be believed, mm. it would seem to insinuate that the Umbra are shards of a broken god, a broken old one, specifically Ka, the one worshipped by the species known as the Hrud. This old one seemingly managed to escape the fate of his species at the conclusion of the war in heaven before ultimately being shattered by Slanesh during the fall of the Eldar Empire. But is this possible? Are the Umbra yes. actually shards of an old one? Would it be possible for them to all come back together as an intact entity? Or is there something else going on here? There hasn't been a lot of information released on these guys in a long time, mm -hmm. so it might be a mystery we unfortunately may never get an answer to. The or it could be like any other thing in 40k, we're going to get a single line of dialogue that <laughs> if you know it, you know it. If you don't know it, you just read over going, what in the world are they talking about? Or you're going to get that one bit of dialogue and you're going to sit back from you're gonna sit there and throw the book across the room like I've done several times. It's like, damn it! Don't don't question me. The deep warp theory. Proponents of the deep warp theory believe that the entirety of what we've been shown of the Immaterium so far in Warhammer 40k is nothing but the tiniest, most insignificant portion of it, hmm. and that much like how the oceans of ancient Terra were, the deeper you go into its waters, the stranger and more bizarre the entities you encounter. Right. This is the realm of the deep warp, a kingdom built upon a foundation of rotting gods the darkest, most turbulent depths of the Sea of Souls, an alien realm of psychic darkness where even demons and deities refuse to tread. To understand Wouldn't what surprise me. is, we can look at a real-world phenomena that takes place in our oceans each and every day, mm -hmm. known as a whale fall. When a whale dies, its body sinks to the ocean floor. Their corpse can often create a hyper-complex localized ecosystem that supplies substance to a variety of different deep-sea organisms. Mm -hmm. It can take years or even decades for these carrion feeders to completely devour every last inch of the massive creature until <laughs> all that remains is a lonely and forgotten skeleton. And all of these entities slink back away into the black. Proponents ah. of the Deep Warp theory believe that much like the oceans of ancient Terra, the Sea of Souls works in a similar manner. That when a significantly powerful warp entity or great deity dies, its essence sinks deep beneath the turbulent tides into an infinite well of madness and insanity. Mm. Whereupon it will be consumed by creatures so alien and bizarre, it's impossible to even attempt to describe them. There are some who like to point to the existence of the Well of Eternity as evidence that the Deep Warp is in fact real. It is said to be a vast receptacle of knowledge and arcane power, the center of all reality, the place where time and space originated and ended, a place that even the Chaos Gods are afraid to go to. The concept of the Warp is not just a stagnant realm of infinite energy in every direction and has distinct areas to it, some vastly more dangerous, turbulent, or unknowable than others, is an idea that was commonplace amongst the Thousand Sons of the Great Crusade era. Yep. For the most part, they were told to stick to what they refer to as the Shoals of the Great Ocean, mm -hmm. and to never venture too deep, for humanity wasn't ready for that. However, the idea of the Deep Warp itself is not something that I have found within their writings. Most of the people who subscribe to the Deep Warp theory will often point to one particular passage where they believe it is mentioned in the novel The Path of Heaven by Chris Raitt. There are layers. There's stratum ethereus, the shallow ways. There is stratum profundus, the greater arteries. And plunging deeper, there is stratum obscurus, the root of terror. No living man can navigate the deep ways. Even he could not. It's not a mirror. It moves like a living thing. It is a living thing. It touch it and it trembles. I do not have the eye but I still have seen things. I have studied what they study. The complexity is immortal. The sea is an ocean. Yes. All know this. It has currents, it has depths, it has storms. Near the surface, you can see the cardomancer's light. You can follow it. You can use your Geller Aegis and you are kept barred from the intelligences. But even then, you are just below the upper limits. 
go deeper, and the Aegis shatters. The lights go out. The eye is blinded. When men say they traverse the warp, they boast, for no mortal does more than skim across eternity's face, like stones thrown by a child. We do not belong there. It is poison for us, and the deeper <coughs> end, the worse the poison. It takes the power of a tormented sun just to puncture the shallowest shoals. No energy in our arsenal could possibly pierce further. String the reactors of a dozen battleships together, double their potential, and it still would not be enough. Although you there does want to seem be there to be some anyway. evidence to support the existence of what we would consider to be the Deep Warp, it's important to remember that it's mostly just fan speculation. This is just a theory. True. There's just not enough concrete evidence to point to other than a few key conversations in certain novels. The idea of the Deep Warp is something that I would love Games Workshop to explore a bit more in the future, but I hope they never give us too many definitive answers. It would just kind of ruin the whole cosmic horror vibe this theory has going on. Yes. The mysterious disappearance. Arkan land there he is okay so one thing i was going to mention if he didn't um during when the warp first started becoming kind of turbulent during the war in the heaven heavens there were entities that do not do not match current descriptions of any demons um to describe them is kind of off but they weren't they weren't demons as as it is understood now that demons exist in 40k. Um, they just weren't normal. Um, this was the enslaver plague. And they didn't need warp energy to sustain themselves. Um, they sustained themselves off the warp energy. Off, like they didn't need a warp rift to sustain themselves. They sustained themselves off the energy that was they were feeding off of. But no creatures like the Enslavers have existed before then. And even though there are things called Enslavers that roam around 40k now, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing, and everybody admits it. Whatever the Enslavers were that came during the War in the heaven, uh, Heavens, they were so unrelentingly powerful that they <laughs> it pretty much ended... The war in heaven. It it dis there was nothing left. Appearance of Arkan Land. The earliest mention that we have of the famous techno-archaeologist Arkan Land comes from an old White Dwarf article where it was revealed that he discovered the STC fragments that contained the blueprints for the Land Raiders. Mm -hmm. Meaning that, yes, the Land Raiders are named as such due to the man that discovered them. He was always just this obscure background character that no one really knew anything about and just kind of served as a fun fact to know about Land Raiders. But that would all change in the Horus Heresy novel line, as yes. he was a prominent character in several of the books and really came into his own. A lot of Warhammer fans, myself included, think he's an absolute treasured smart boy. I genuinely find him hilarious and charming. One of my absolute favorite inventions of his is a pet cyborg monkey. Yes. Now, monkeys have been extinct on Terra for tens of thousands of years, so he had to go off of their fossil records in order to recreate them. Mm -hmm. And he gave it a scorpion tail. He because did. that's kind of what it looks like if you've just got bones to work with. When questioned about this by another individual who pointed out that their tail was probably prehensile and used to hang from branches, Arkin Land said that that was absolutely ridiculous. What purpose <laughs> would that serve? Monkeys were clearly deranged and venomous predators. Yes, I definitely. I love this dude. However, Arkin Land unfortunately suffers from the same fate that a lot of 40k characters do, wherein originally they're just a little bit of background fluff, and then they become characters in their own right in the later novels. But right. that very first mention that we got of him didn't just tell us who he was. It told us how he died. As a techno-archaeologist, Land had dedicated his life to scouring the catacombs and tech vaults beneath the surface of Mars mm -hmm. in order to recover fragments of STCs and pieces of ancient lost archaeotech from the Dark Age of Technology. It was because of his efforts that the Imperium has access to some of their greatest technology. At one point, he led a three-year expedition into the Librarius Ominous, which is an ancient underground library the size of a continent that stretches underneath the surface of Mars. Yeah, get your library card out for that one. It was here that he discovered not only the blueprints for the Land Raider pattern main battle tank, but also a universal land engine that would later become the basis of the Onagur Dunecrawler, and patterns for anti-gravitic plates that would be utilized in the construction of land speeders, again named after him. 
In addition to this, he was able to map a region of the catacombs the size of a small nation. Now, despite his efforts, the vast library still had many secrets left to be uncovered. Yep. It was, however, years later, after the conclusion of the Horus Heresy, that Land would lead his fated second expedition into the library. He was never seen again, and only a single record of the expedition was ever uncovered. It consisted of a box diary, wherein Land's panicked voice could be heard speaking about his team, how they were being picked off one by one by some unknown entity that was lurking in the darkness. I can't put into words just how dangerous of a place Mars actually is. Yeah. There are all forms of mutants, rogue AIs, and unfathomable blasphemous machines that roam out in the wastes. And we can only imagine what ancient, unspeakable horrors dwell beneath its dunes. It's worth bearing in mind for comparison that Mars is indeed the planet where the Catan known as the Void Dragon is buried. I personally don't believe the Void Dragon had anything to do with this disappearance, as the Mechanicum book makes it pretty clear that it's contained, but it is worth mentioning as it sets a pretty dangerous precedent for all manner of horrifying entities of impossible power running loose beneath Mars's red sands. It's more or less contained. It's more or less contained. It's a, it's asleep, asleep, but its dreams are affecting the Mechanicus and have since its inception. What ultimately killed Land and his crew is subject to limitless debate. Many speculate that it was some type of predator, while others claim it was a psychic entity, or perhaps even a sentient virus. Whatever the case may be, whatever ultimately is lurking deep in the dark, perhaps it is simply proof that the secrets of the dark age of technology are best left to the shadows of mystery and prehistory. Yeah. What is written on the Terminus Decree? The Terminus oh, Decree okay. is one Okay. The Terminus Decree. The plot by the Emperor to turn Terra into a second Eye of Terra. One of the most sacred and mysterious relics in the entirety of the Imperium's history. <sighs> It is said that at any given point in time, only a single person alive knows of it and that each and every one of those individuals was a supreme Grand Master of the Grey Knights chapter of Space Marines. It is locked away within the Chamber of Purity on Titan, inside of the tomb of Malkador the Sigilite, and is comprised of a single box with instructions stating that it should only be opened when the death of humanity is at hand, when the clock finally strikes midnight and the long war comes to an end. Mm -hmm. Now, what exactly the Terminus Decree is still remains a mystery. I mean- It's not so much a mystery anymore. There's been too much to come out about it. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the Blood Ravens. Because there was a lot of speculation on who the Blood Ravens were, you know, all this other kind of stuff. But it's pretty much confirmed at this point that they're Magnus's kids. Now, my debate on that is far from over because I think the Grey Knights were always meant to be the Grey Knights and they weren't going to be Magnus's kids. I think the Blood Ravens were the ones that were going to replace the Thousand Suns. I'm just saying. Fight me. I mean, technically, there could be anything inside of that box. Some believe that it contains an artifact of great and terrible power that can summon a force beyond comprehension that will single-handedly destroy all of mankind's enemies, while others speculate that it is a device capable of purging the warp itself of all demonic influence. That'd be nice. And most of these rumors center around it bringing salvation to mankind and paving the way forward for a new golden age. While these theories are certainly optimistic, as something that is severely lacking in the grim darkness of the far future, I'm not entirely convinced. And that's for a couple of reasons. The first is that if it truly was a device that would bring about the salvation of humanity, why wouldn't they have used it yet? Secondly, Terminus literally means the end, and the sigil that is inscribed upon the box can only be found in one other location in the galaxy, uh. the Golden Throne. This has led many to speculate that it contains instructions for shutting down the Golden Throne, thus allowing the Emperor to end his long vigil and finally be allowed to die. The more hopeful interpret this as that since the Emperor is a perpetual, he would be reborn, rising up to push back the darkness and lead humanity into the future once more. Yeah, but there no. are a lot of unknowns when it comes to the Emperor's perpetualness. Not all perpetuals are the same. Sometimes they respawn in only a short period of time in the exact same location, and other times they pop up somewhere else in the galaxy. Mm -hmm. It could take seconds, minutes, years, decades, or even centuries. 
With this information in mind, shutting down the Golden Throne could be an apocalyptic scenario. The Astronomicon would fail, cutting off all communication and warp travel. The Emperor would die, thus bringing down his protective psychic barriers around the Soul System. And not to mention Vulcan's doomsday device that is directly linked to the Emperor's pulse yep. would detonate. If the Terminus Decree really is a Golden Throne user manual and details how to shut it down, then its use may be something as grimly simple as an option to let humanity go out on its own terms. True. way of accepting the species extinction with dignity. However, if we want to engage in a healthy dose of optimism, the Terminus Decree may be a set of instructions for the Emperor's revival. This would clarify why it hasn't been used yet, as the Emperor has supposedly been gathering his strength within the warp, and by all accounts is not ready to be revived yet. And considering that Malkador stood by the Emperor's side for thousands of years, knew more about him than any other person in the galaxy, with the exception of perhaps Urda. And most importantly, this relic is housed inside of his tomb and protected by the chapter of Space Marines that he created. The Terminus Decree may be instructions left by Malkador and entrusted to the Grey Knights on how to carry out their final mission. This would make sense seeing that it was revealed in the Siege of Terra that the Grey Knights, although being created during the Horus Heresy, were not made to fight on Terra. Mm -hmm. They were made to fight a war that would come thousands of years later. There's honestly a billion different things that the Terminus Decree could be, so it would be irresponsible for anyone to try to make a definitive claim one way or the other. However, in doing research for this section of the video, I checked out the wiki page on the Terminus Decree in order to get their source list so I could read them for myself. Yeah. And it made a pretty startling claim. Yeah. I've read most of that source list. It's... It it, it, it's a thing. That the Terminus Decree was directly linked to the research of the mad scientist Basilo Fo. If you're unfamiliar with this character, he was a prisoner in the Imperial Palace during the Siege of Terra. During an interview with Euphrati Keeler, it was revealed to us that he was capable of creating an anti-Astartes phage mm -hmm. that could kill all of the Space Marines and their Primarchs. Yep. Now, considering that the palace was at that very- And he wanted to go a little bit further and include the Custodes in that, but unfortunately for him, there was a Custodes standing by him at all times. Very moment under siege by Horus and his armies, the prospect of such a dangerous weapon being unleashed was an option worth considering. It was ultimately decided that the cost would be too great, and thus the phage was not utilized, though Valdor kept the option on the table as a last resort. The novel The End in the Death Volume 1 seems to indicate that Malkador set in motion a series of events that would make sure this option would remain as a viable contingency plan mm -hmm. long after his death, leading many people to believe that this is in fact what is written on the Terminus Decree. Full disclosure, I haven't finished the Siege of Terra yet, as part of doing a lore channel means I need to split my time between the Horus Heresy and more modern 40k books. I'm trudging my way through Mortis, it's not a bad book, but it's definitely the weakest Siege of Terra novel. And yeah, I can agree recording, with that. The new Belisarius Call vs. Fabius Bile book just came out, and I'm personally way more interested in that. <laughs> Anyways, from what I've been able to gather, this is something that is only alluded to in that novel, but it's not directly confirmed. And if this really is what the author is trying to indicate to us, it changes what the Terminus Decree is all about. Because wiping out all of the Astartes, both traitor and loyalist alike, would certainly be a massive blow to the galaxy. But the Space Marines are not the end-all be-all of the Imperium's military might. True. Likewise, Chaos would still exist, with or without the Despoiler's legions. And it would have no impact on all of the hostile Xeno species that wish to bring about the death of mankind. So this would change the Terminus Decree from being the end of humanity to the end of the Space Marines. It's certainly a possibility, but like I said, I'm not entirely convinced. I think it's more just a part of what the Terminus Decree is and not the end-all be-all of it. At the end of the day, we still don't know what the Terminus Decree actually is. And for humanity's sake, hopefully we never will. Yeah. But what do you think of all this? What do you think the Terminus Decree actually is, and what is it eventually going to be used for? Do you think the Umbra are actually shards of an old one, or do you have a different theory? Do you think there's actually such a thing as the Deep Warp, or is this just a fan theory that's gotten too much attention? Let me know all of your thoughts in the comment section down below. And let me know if you know of any other creepy 40k mysteries that you'd love to hear me talk about. I get my best ideas from you guys, and my favorite part about doing YouTube as a full-time job is having a constant group of people that I can nerd out about 40k with. Anyways, yeah, big nerding out to is fun. Who supports the work that I do, and I will catch you all in the next one. So, the Terminus Decree, as laid by down by Malkador, um, 
there are several hints to what it what it is and several hints to what it isn't. But the biggest one that I've seen is when the Emperor finally dies. What happens when the Emperor finally dies? Well, first things first, um, Terra's gone. Earth is gone. I mean, it's just going to get swallowed. I'm surprised I didn't hear a crash right there. Um, the... The sheer fact of the matter is, the second the Emperor dies, Terra is gone. Because he's the only thing currently holding back the warp from literally coming through a warp rift that Magnus opened 10,000 years ago. I mean, he's the only thing holding it back. Um, there is no second plan. There is no second anything. It's a done deal. So the Terminus Decree is when the Golden Throne stops working. That's what happens there. Once it reaches a certain critical point. Now, I could be full of crap. I know I have been proven full of crap on more than one occasion when it comes to for, when it comes to some things in 40K that, you know, we're just guessing what they do. Um, but I believe that's what it boils down to. <sighs> Warpugs, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go take a look outside and I'm gonna go pets and pet little Connor and see if she's ready to give birth to puppies yet because she has been a pain beyond a pain check the links in the description down below guys and uh, I will catch you next time that kind of freaked me out just a second ago there but I hope you guys have a good day take care of yourselves alright and don't don't go to the deep end don't go to the people. It's a it's not a good place.